it's way overkill and it's kind of stupid for a bush plane i'm gonna go drag around in the weeds and get all dirty it's physics math and engineering machine it draft it build it test it break it every time something new gets built the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. Hey guys, took a quick break away from Scrappy. I wanted to do it in a weekend. It took a couple days longer, so about a week. Um, this whole room behind me, I don't know if you'd ever noticed, but it's brand new. Uh, none of this existed. And I just, it used to just go all the way to the back of the hangar, like over here. But I wanted a better place to do all the dirty work. So we drew this up on SolidWorks. And on SolidWorks, you can map out what the steel is and get the weight. This weighs 2,042 pounds of awesome. <laughs> this is just a giant one inch thick plate of steel. We plasma cut it. All these holes you see back here at the back, those are all suction vents, so as I'm working, it will suck the air away from me and into some vents and through a HEPA filter. But it's here, let's get it installed. Let's get to work. So now we gotta get really creative, get it down on some big foam blocks, some rollers, twist it, slide it in, jack it up. It's a really tight fit, so uh, I have a half inch clearance uh, total on everything. So. It's gonna be a little bit of a trick, but we'll get it in, and then we're gonna build something cool. A pallet jack on a pallet jack. You get, do whatever you gotta do. We might hear a little bit of wood crack in here. I'm almost done. I wanted to be a weekend project. We've got a couple days over, but I've had to work every day. But we're gonna be way under a week after hours. I'm down to my HEPA filter, and this I drew on the computer, so should be able to plug in my 220 power right here. And then roll this into the rounded socket in the one inch table. Now that that's in, I gotta put a pipe from the back there to the hole in the back corner of the table over there. I'll do a ducted pipe underneath. Success! I'm gonna get no more paint done, little button up, some piping. I got some shelves to go in, some hooks to go on. I'll get all that done tonight. And then I'm determined to get some stuff on Scrappy, so let's get to work. Put this wall up, I actually divided it, put a storage room up above it, and I made this fabrication room. So I've got two doors that close up. Um, I put in a big well table, I'm still organizing, it's a big mess, but uh, put a wall up, a shelf. Um, I put four fans in here, and let me tell you why. So I've got two air conditioner swamp cooler fans that are blowing air in, which is pressurizing the room. I can close the doors, but I put two giant outlet fans, and these fans, those fans flow 25% more air than the inbound fans. And the purpose of that is I wanted to make sure if I kick those on, that this could pull air stronger than those could blow, so that I don't blow dust out into my shop. But if I close the doors, this room becomes a negative pressure zone because I have more suction than I do inbound. So the reason why I have inbound fans and outbound fans is if I turn them all on, it's like a little hurricane in here. The wind is coming in so fast and out so fast, it is just dust free. So my grinders in here, I still gotta organize all more. My, my sizers, my pole saws, my band saws, but mostly welder and fab shop. And then my table has holes in the back create vacuum with this HEPA filter, you won't hear a thing. Anyway, that's so that the air is not working. I can take the cardboard off there. All the dust can go to the back that's heavier that can't lift and go out the fans, but any heavier stuff will go down into the back of the table. I can also just brush everything into those, like they're, they're all the way down, the whole, the whole table has them all the way down. I can just brush the debris into it, 
There's a big giant pipe that goes underneath there, goes into this filter. Um, it has a cyclone effect, drops the heavier stuff in a trash can for me, filters the air, and then also if I cover those up, I've got a floor vac on the floor. So I take my air hose, silly little things, and I would just blow the floor and the table into the corner under the table and all the dirt and debris goes right into the filter and trash. So um, we've been using it for a while, so I thought I'd just give you a quick tour. It's finally done and uh, man, makes life good. It's also ice cold in here, so when it gets warm out there, it's like a little chiller room. So I'm gonna get back to work. Hey guys, um, starting the assembly of Scrappy, this crazy bush plane we're building. And I'm getting to the oil cooler and I wanted to give you an update on some changes I made to it and why. So these are the oil coolers I had in it and they were perfect. Um, other than I need to straighten up the fins on them because they're used out of my old race plane, but they were sized perfectly for the motor as it was 500 horsepower. However, <laughs> I got this crazy idea that maybe, just maybe, someday <laughs> I might add more horsepower. Boy, have you lost your mind because I'll help you find it. So I thought, you know what? It'd be really difficult to add later. So I called up Aero Classics, some friends of mine. They make amazing custom one-of-a-kind oil coolers plus all the regular ones for all your aircraft. And I decided if I added more horsepower, I need more thermal rejection. I recalculated what I needed and I needed about four more inches by about eight inches more. That's what she said. <laughs> area if I were to possibly bump the power up. So we're making a brand new one. So I'll, I'll save this for a later build and uh, I'm gonna put in this bigger brand new oil cooler. Now, real quick, an oil cooler, if it's going on the back of the engine, it's got a lot of vibration. You really wanna isolate it up near the firewall, anywhere you got that heavy pounding of an engine and vibration. They tend to crack around the edges. So uh, Aero Classics and I, when we were designing the new one, we put big, heavy, thick plates on it, uh, on the mounting flange, big gussets on the side, reinforced it for heavy vibration, and then I have it in the back of the plane where I have virtually no vibration. It's so far away from the engine. And then uh, it's designed now to be a hard mount. However, even though I can hard mount it, I still want to add an extra lever level of safety. So not only do I have the thick thicker flanges, <laughs> the gussets, but, the frame, the aluminum frame that I'm mounting on, that is isolated at, uh, got a thin rubber isolation at the bar attach point to take away that high frequency vibration that should have very little to none at this location. But then there's an aluminum plate that comes in that then the oil cooler plate mounts to and that gives another area of slight movement to absorb any vibration. So uh, I'm able to hard mount this with some two stages of isolation for vibration, even though it's not completely necessary. Of course, on the front of the engine, absolutely necessary. If you're doing an oil cooler, just isolate it. Because if, if you're not completely sure you're in a good shape, make sure you get that mounted really well and try and isolate the vibration out of it the best you can. Now, the back of the plane, I could do flex line up to the oil cooler. Um, I, I elected to go with hard pipe all the way. Now, I'd never do that at the front of the plane. You're just asking for a line to kind of eventually fatigue. Uh, at the back of the plane, uh, I want to have this great big loop you can see here. The big loop is just allows for thermal expansion and contraction of the aluminum pipe at that place. And it just happens in just the slightest movement way at the back, and it's a big arc. So, uh, and then without, the vibration in the back, I can hard pipe it direct, and that's gonna be a really safe solution. Um, at the front of the engine, I'd never do that. So the lines that go to the front of the plane, they go to an, uh, the bulkhead part I machined, and then from there, it's all flex line. So um, I need to get this installed because we gotta put this plane together. So let's get back to work. All right, guys, I'm on the home stretch. Got eight bolts aside, 16 bolts is gonna hold this oil cooler in the worst of landing. So we're all set there, got the flares done. Before I put this on, anytime I work with any of the hoses, 
always got to make sure you blow them out so there's little teeny particulates of aluminum that get in it when you flare the end so i've opened up the other end this is one seamless line all the way to the firewall no other unions other than right here so that minimizes leaks i can see the blanket over there blowing in the wind so we got that blown out and if things went right these should both go on that one went on nice. And perfect. All I got left, I'm gonna get my torque wrench, torque these down to spec. I've got one more Adele clamp. I'm gonna clamp this right to the side of this bar. Make sure it can't move. We're already strapped together, clamped all the way to the front of the plane. So 10 more minutes. The last will be this, and I'll go home before midnight, maybe. <laughs> It'll be close. That's my goal. Final step, going to bed. Done. Good night. I finally get to put my airbox in. I'm super excited. And uh, I finished this late, late last night, just after midnight. And uh, I'm very excited to uncover it because we're done. And I, I gotta tell you, Aero Classics did the best job. I want you to come take a close look. Look how tight all the fit is the welds, look up on this backside. I'm, I really love a nice clean weld. And I tell you what, if that were steel, I would be impressed. And aluminum, that's kind of a pain in the butt. They did such a good job. The fit worked out perfect and it went right in. So I finally get to put this in, my big air box, and it's going in to stay. So, and know it's gonna be a very snug fit. You can see the rounded shape of the fuselage here. When I put the fuselage on, this has got the arc to it, and it's gonna attach all the way around it. The big scoops are right there. The outlet's right here. Oil cooler installed. Thanks, Aeroplastic, you guys rock. I, I couldn't be happier with the work you guys did. It's so easy to get to this point and go so fast. Here's my pressurized top for the air box. And <laughs> that is so good. Let's put it down. Okay, I've got the top down. Now every single connection on this air box through the oil cooler, I'm using a gasket sealer, so it's airtight. The only air that can get, that goes in, can only go out through the oil cooler, with exception of this. I machined this little teeny bracket. You can see I lightened it up. This is going in the bottom. You see, I just drilled these holes through here. This port goes down here. This is just a drain. So if I'm going through a rainstorm, be a ton of water funneling into here. Usually in a cowling, it just drains out the bottom of the cowling. I don't want it draining into the belly of the plane and working its way into my belly pod where I'll have my sleeping bag. So drain, it's going on the bottom. And then I'm done with this. The last closeout is the fuselage. And this box and oil cooler are complete. So, next project. All right, guys, drain lines in. I'm gonna do a little test. Now, the flow rate should be able to handle any normal rainstorm that I would be flying through. But <laughs> if somehow I got into a crazy rainstorm, it might exceed the water that this drain can take. That's a pretty good amount. But I've made this secondary plate. This is gonna go right up here. It's a partition carbon fiber plate that separates my luggage bay on the belly pod from the fuel sump drain, my wing empty uh, drain valve assembly, and that will go in, and I'm gonna go ahead and RTV gasket sealer this in place, and then I got two giant inch and a half holes right down here where these pass through. So if for some reason, that's already all empty. If for some reason this drain couldn't keep up with the rain, 
Um, it will go into overflow into the belly, come down, hit this wall, it'll be sealed up. And with two inch and a, almost inch and a quarter diameter holes, everything's gonna go straight out. So my secondary backup, so my sleeping bags don't get wet. So I'm done. <laughs> Let's get another project out of the way. Hey guys, I'm so dang happy with how this is turning out. Like just this simple little part. There's only five different colors on here. Clear, under the orange, has got white, because to get orange this bright, you gotta stick white under it as a base. Then the orange, black, silver, and then all the little names on it. There's five colors. I was counting it up, depending on what part of the aircraft. This has been in the booth and out to be sanded 15 times to get to this level. So. It's way overkill and it's kind of stupid for a bush plane I'm gonna go drag around in the weeds and get all dirty. But I don't care, I wanted it to really come out clean. So if you take a look at why it took so many layers, this is the original carbon fiber. There's absolutely no body work. And if you look down it, that was a pain in the butt. So to get it to this level, I literally had to do extra layers of carbon sand through, add another layer of carbon to clean it up. There is no micro, no filler. That is 100% raw carbon original. Then several layers of clear, sand it back, clear, sand it back. I didn't want to add weight by adding lots of layers, but to get this finish where you can't even feel a line at all on any of these color steps, you just have to keep sanding it back, adding the layers, clearing it, sanding back to the steps. Oh, I'm winded just telling you about it. My gosh, it was a big job, but I'll bring you around. Little things like this. Look at the door. I had to mask off the Y here, but then spray it again with the Y underneath it. So lots of little details. Kind of look down this edge. I don't know, I'm, I'm pumped. Um, all the names I got in it, I'm really excited about. Here's where that inspection door goes. But I got all my favorite flying groups are in. Very subtle. I have one more round to do on this. Sand it, three different grits. Cut, buff, polish. Because tomorrow, by the end of the day, this is gonna be on Scrappy, permanent. I'm so pumped. So I'm gonna call it a night, wrap it up. We'll see you soon. I'm making some sleep. And then as always, back to work. Okay guys, I am so close. I'm getting ready to put the tail on the plane for the final time, it's final assembly. All I've had left is I've been cutting up almost 200 of these little isolator paths. They're just a clear, thin isolator that goes on each of these hundreds of bolts that bolt the carbon fiber fuselage to the frame. So when I built it, I had a 0.035 thick aluminum skin that I wrapped the frame, and that was an intentional thickness. Then I laid the carbon on that. That actually made an 035 gap. So after nut plate, get the appropriate thickness offset spacer. It eliminates vibration and stops galvanic corrosion between the two. So I gotta stick all these isolator pads on. The belly's going on, and we're gonna have it done as far as I've ever had it. I can't even talk, I'm so excited. Let's get back to work. <laughs> That couldn't have gone any better first try. It's snap locked on, couple screws holding it. I've got a little bit more work to do. I'm gonna pull the screws out in the areas I'm working. I'm gonna sand this down, cut, buff, polish. We'll get it even shinier. And then I'll get this plane flying, take it in the back country and we'll dirty it up again. So I'm gonna get back to work. I'm getting final assembly done on all the panels, with the exception of the cowling I haven't got done yet, but I'm really excited about it. This is the last part I've got to do some final trimming on. This is the arc window I made. I got it taped to protect it. This is all painted up. Right now, all I need to do is cut out the parachute tracks 
that pair up with the tracks in the ceiling that are already made. So um, I left it together until I was all done with paint. But I'll go ahead and cut this out. I got my new room done over here, so it's kind of noisy in here. But I got my two inbound fans, my two outbound fans. I'm gonna close these double doors. We'll put it on the table right here. I'll put on my mask, put on my mask, put on my glasses. But there's so much wind coming from my back because the power fan's coming this way and the exit here that when I'm cutting, the dust just flies out. So I'm really excited about my new little room. It's working out great. I also got my HEPA filter right here. I plug this in. It turns on suction to these back grills. So what happens now is when I cut, any heavy hair that can't lift to that big fan over there pulls to the back of the table. It goes into a giant pipe through here and into a down to a couple micron filter. So I don't know. It's a little bit safer. I've been a little bit careless, not wearing masks and not taking care of myself. A lot of you made lots of comments, and you know what? I have to agree with all of you, so I'm doing a better job. And I made a room specifically to help make sure that I stick around a while. So thanks, guys. You motivated me. I got my new room. Let's cut apart. All right, guys. We've got it all done. It looks a little flimsy, because it is. <laughs> uh, but what's great is everything's set up just kind of snap lock on, all the edges have returns. But where I get all my strength is when I built my parachute strap boxes, I made them really thick and made them a structural C-channel arcing beam that chases the exact arc of this top. And all these holes you see is everywhere there's a screw that attaches it. So when this goes on and I bolt it together, you could stand on top of this. So it's a little flimsy now, but it won't be. So let's install it. All right, I'm getting ready to put these on. I just trial fit them all. Everything went perfect. So I've got them pulled back off to so put my antennas on. I actually can get to these antennas. They're in the luggage compartment, but I just want to make sure they seal up good. But these I molded in my antenna bays as I went. They have an O-ring right here. So I wanted to be able to mold it in and get a nice flat surface. There's that one. Here's my other GPS antenna with a rubber seal. That one, so turned out great. I'm gonna get them bolted down, sealed up, then we'll put it back on the plane. And it really will be for good this time. <laughs> Let's get to work. I finally get to put the rudder on. This will be the first time it goes on painted and it's gonna stay on, so I'm excited. I got my son Dex. This is my youngest son Dex. He's hiding, there he is. <laughs> Dex, I mean, it's just about midnight. I wanted to get this on tonight before we went home, so Dex came down to give me a hand. All right, I'm gonna gently tap that. It'll go right in, but that is snug. There's no play at all. So, <laughs> tap the top one in, put the nuts on it, hook up some cables, we'll call it a night.
Mark and the boys just getting back from river rafting. And if you're wondering, yes, that's scrappy resin all over my pants. <laughs> All right guys, I'm getting everything final assembled at the back of the plane. And I wanted to show a little bit more about my gust lock system. I showed it when I made a plate and I, I actually didn't go into enough detail on that. And I seem to miss a lot of the details and I get a lot of questions. So I'm gonna go into it a little bit more now and a little bit more later when I install it in the front. But there's actually two of these gust lock pins. One is to pivot, a fulcrum locking arm that then I can pin to the control stick that locks aileron and elevator. The length of the pivot of that unit will hold the elevator at the position I want for wind, whether it's coming forward or backwards and it's neutral. And there's a lot more to it and it has to do with something else I'll show you later, but I'll stop it at that. But the second pin is for the rudder gust lock. So I have elevator, aileron with one pin the exact same identical pin comes back here and i don't know if i mentioned in other bit in, in an earlier video i don't think i did i tend to leave a lot of things off and skip too much my apologies this is as far as i know i'm the only cub that's ever done it if someone's done it i've never heard of it but this secondary carbon fiber connection i've got the normal connections at the bottom for rudder control this upper one that's not familiar and this tab coming out is for a yaw damp on my autopilot. So right behind this inspection plate is a Garmin servo running a yaw damp. What that does, if you're not into aviation, the autopilot can handle up, down, right, left. A yaw is not as common and certainly not on the smaller aircraft. It is on the larger. The yaw keeps the tail if you hit a bump or the air is unstable from kind of wagging back and forth. And so a lot of times if you're in the back seat of a cub, you tend to feel this motion anytime you hit bumps and it, and it wiggles. A yaw damp is an electric servo motor that can push and pull on this as fast as the air tries to move it. So it counteracts very quickly and makes adjustment that you can't do fast enough. And it keeps the tail of the plane perfectly straight. Now this shouldn't have much if any yaw at all because I've got such a large oversized uh, tail section. It's normally about that tall in this area and then the rudder on it. So it's really large, should be stable, but I did a yaw damp anyway. This pin <laughs> went off on a tangent. Uh, this pin right here slides in through here and I'll show a close up of that in a minute. Um, that locks and you can't pull that out. And what I did is where this hump is, on the backside, I actually have a full carbon fiber tube that goes into the plane as well, so that the pin passes in one side through this connecting tube out the other side. The connecting tube, I made solid by doing a carbon fiber tube and inserting a fiberglass rod through it so that when I passed this pin through it, it passed through a solid composite bar, not a hollow bar. And then the tube on the outside and the inside, the large diameter tube is quarter wall thick. So we have a quarter inch of carbon fiber material, stronger than quarter inch plate. So that no matter what forces I put on this, there's absolutely zero movement for my gust lock. Now, this is kind of cool. I went ahead, went ahead and hooked up micro switches. And the purpose of that is so that you can't start scrappy if the gus locks are locked. So this has to be removed. Drop it in the panel in its storage hole. It's, there's two locking points for the two separate pins. One drops in and it hits a micro switch that then allows the start button to work. And then the other pin actually goes in and locks a pivot arm into its location so that it can't bounce back and get in the way of the stick. But I'll show more of that later. So anyway, I'm getting closer. Lots of little details coming together. Rudder lock 
key <laughs> for my start. So I, I guess you'd consider this the key to Scrappy, but I actually did something else, a little secret. So you need to do a couple little tricks and then you can start it. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it. We'll talk more about that later, but that's essentially a two-step key. Remove, you can't fly on accident with your controls locked. Insert in the dash, hits another micro switch, then the start button will work. If you don't do that, you can't fly Scrappy. So I'll never leave this in. Let's get back to work. All right, guys, I'm just gonna wrap up this video right here, but before I go, I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna see if it might be helpful for those who wanna stick around. I'm gonna try and answer some of the questions that come along the way from all of you. So this time, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about oil cooler since we've made that change today and attempt to do a better job at my not so great or expanded explanation of my ability to increase and decrease the temperature of the oil on Scrappy. So let me talk a little bit about why I have that and about a thermostat control. So this, ta-da, <laughs> is a Vernatherm. And I, sometimes I might call it Vermatherm, but it's Vernatherm, so if I screw up, you guys know. Um, they're usually located in one of three locations, often right at the back of the engine, sometimes remote mount. This is Scrappy's, which was formerly in the aircraft. It is now out of the aircraft. The third location is right at the oil cooler. So when I made my new oil cooler with Aero Classics, I went ahead and put the Vernatherm right at the oil cooler so that the oil goes all the way to the back of the plane and just keeps that line warm because it's a long distance and it just keeps that viscosity really quick so whenever the adjustment of the burnotherm that controls the flow of the oil needs to happen, it's all the way back right at the cooler itself. So how does a burn a therm work and why would I want adjustment beyond it? At no point would you ever want to eliminate a ver vernotherm, your thermostat for your oil, because what it does, it takes away all your pilot work with load. You wouldn't want to do oil doors and eliminate this. And what you do, the way it works is oil comes in, comes out, goes through the oil cooler, goes back, returns to the engine. Inside here is a spring and a bypass that jumps. We got a jet going by, so it's a squirrel moment for me. There is a bypass port that jumps from this point to this point. What will happen, and it can never close, you can actually see all the way through it, and if I open it up, you can see the bypass. The way it works is oil is gonna flow the path of least resistance like any fluid. So as the oil comes in here, though it could go straight through the oil cooler and come back, it won't want to because the oil cooler has thin, thin fins and the oil gets backed up at the cooler. And so the oil wants to just come in here, jump through the bypass hole and return. And that warms up the oil in the engine first. And as it gets hotter and hotter, what actually occurs is it changes the temperature of the valve and size, causes the plunger to slowly close this bypass jump port. And as it gets hotter and it's, it's variable, the hotter it gets, the more it pushes a plunger and closes that port. The colder it gets, it opens up. As it opens, keeps hot air, oil in the engine. As it gets too hot, it closes, forces the path of least resistance to now be through the oil cooler. The more it closes, it gets more through the oil cooler. And if it gets really hot, that slams shut, all the oil goes through the oil cooler. So. Probably didn't do a good job because a lot of you thought I was eliminating this by doing oil doors. That would be tough because then I'd be babysitting a dial all the time. So that never went away until I made my new oil cooler and pulled it out because it's on the oil. So why on earth would I want adjustable doors? A couple of you figured it out, which was pretty awesome reading through the comments and probably uh, many of you maybe didn't get to see them, but they nailed it. It's actually about parasitic drag, cooling drag. As this air comes in, cooling oil, it exits right here and it billows out and it creates a lot more drag on the aircraft. It slows the plane down. So this adjustable temperature control is all about increasing speed, 
in cruise flight only. I don't want to babysit my oil temperature. That, that could add a lot of risks. So the Vermitherm standard practice, the oil doors will be wide open, 100% air can go through. I can take off, climb, 100 horsepower, 500 horsepower, never even use the doors at all on any flight if I wanted because the Vermitherm is going to keep the oil in line to 179 degrees, continually open up to try and keep it there. But what's great is once I'm in cruise flight and I got a three hour leg ahead of me, for a couple minutes, I can just slowly close those doors and eventually, instead of the temperature being at 180 range, I can start watching it come up, 185, 190, 200. That means that now I'm creating heat by reducing air and increasing speed. So that's all it's about. When you get ready to come into land, I just open the doors wide open, let the vermitherm do the rest. But oil doesn't break down its thermal viscosity. There's a point if you get oil too hot, it becomes so liquid that suddenly it doesn't have the lubrication properties. And that usually happens at about 220 to 230 degrees, much hotter than that. Then if you have a constant speed prop, it gets so thin that even your constant speed prop will, won't have the ability to hold the pressure through the seals, the blades will go flat, it's a big giant mess. It also will start tearing down your motor. But that thermal breakdown is 220, 230 range. If you got a synthetic, we can go above that. So I can easily turn it up into the 200. Everything's happy, everything's running perfect, and the plane is faster. So that's what I was doing with my oil doors. I hope that makes more sense. I have my Vermitherm. Thank you, Air Classics, for making a really cool oil cooler for me that can handle a little more power. We'll see if that comes into play. I'm gonna end this video right here. Thanks for joining me, following along. I hope you like my silliness, scrappy aircraft build. Come back, I got really cool stuff coming. Like, subscribe if you haven't. Like and subscribe, can't even use all my words, if you haven't. And uh, we'll see you next time.